what exactly is liberal hegemony? My argument is that liberal hegemony is a policy, it's a foreign policy, that's designed to remake the world in America's image. And there are three elements involved. The first, and the most important, is to spread democracy all over the planet. And this, of course, leads us to go around the world knocking off regimes, toppling authoritarian leaders, and trying to promote democracy. That's number one. Number two is to promote an open international economy and do everything we can to get countries all around the world deeply enmeshed in that open international economy. And then the third goal is to also get countries all around the world deeply enmeshed in the international institutions that we, the United States, largely created after World War II. So those are the basic goals. And the belief is that if you can make the world look like America, right, the end result will be, number one, you will eliminate human rights violations all around the world. Because as you all know, liberal democracies don't violate human rights or individual rights on a massive scale. And if the world is comprised of only liberal democracies, the problem is taken off the table. Second, if the world is comprised of nothing but liberal democracies, you will get peace because liberal democracies don't fight each other, according to the liberal story. And once you get peace, the terrorism problem is taken off the table, and the proliferation problem is taken off the table. And then the third great benefit is you make the world safe for democracy. As you know, inside any liberal state, you're going to have elements that are unhappy with liberalism. They may be communists during the Cold War or what have you. And those people who don't like liberalism seek allies in other countries, i.e. communists looking to the Soviet Union to help them. But if the world is comprised of only liberal democracies, those disenchanted people inside your liberal democracy have no foreign allies. Again, Woodrow Wilson referred to this as making the world safe for democracy. So this is really what liberal, demo liberal uh, hegemony is all about. So can you walk us through the catalog of failures that are attributable to this commitment? Well, Just the highlights. Yeah. I, I, I think there, there are three big highlights. Uh, the first is the Bush Doctrine. And, and the Bush Doctrine, of course, was all about spreading democracy in the Middle East. Uh, Iraq was just the first stop on the railroad line. We were going to promote democracy in Syria, in Iran, and so forth and so on. Uh, and of course, that was a catastrophic failure. The amount of blood that we have on our hands, given what's happened in the Middle East, is just hard to describe. Second great failure is uh, NATO expansion uh, and EU expansion and our efforts uh, to take those two institutions, NATO and the EU, and march them up to Russia's doorstep and create a giant zone of peace in Western and Eastern Europe. This, of course, led to the crisis over Ukraine. Most Americans believe that Russia is responsible for the Ukraine crisis. I don't believe that for one second. The United States and its West European allies are responsible for the crisis over Ukraine because we thought, foolishly, because we were thinking like liberals, not like realists, that we could actually march an alliance that was a mortal enemy of the Soviet Union right up to Russia's doorsteps. And of course, it all blew up in our face. And then the third great policy failure is engagement with China. Most of the proponents of that view who thought that engaging China would turn it into democracy, and then we would have love, peace, and dope from there on out, have now admitted that it was a failure. And instead, what we did was help create a behemoth. OK, so before I get to questioning some elements of that thesis, one reason I think why America, one reason that's often given for why this liberal hegemony strategy might work is that it worked after World War II. It's every element I think that you described, remaking the world in the American image, an open economy, commitment to international institutions, was, now maybe you want to say that wasn't an era of international hegemony because we, there was a bipolar situation with the Soviet Union. I'm just wondering, how do you distinguish what the United States did just after World War II? It seemed relatively successful, maybe you want to contest that, to what happened after 89 or 2001? Well, let me just say generally what we did after World War II uh, up till the end of the Cold War was extremely successful. There's no question about but that. But it, it seems to have the patina of, of liberalism as an element of foreign policy. So the, why, why am I wrong about that? The key word is patina. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, 
in the book, I argue that the only world in which you can have the United States pursuing liberal hegemony is a unipolar world. It's very important to emphasize this, because in a unipolar world where the United States, by definition, is the only great power, is the sole pole, it is free to pursue liberal hegemony. Otherwise, it has to behave in a realist fashion. So if you're in a bipolar world, you're in a bipolar world like we were during the Cold War, you have to act largely according to the dictates of realism. Now, with regard to those three elements, spreading democracy and open international economy and international institutions, first of all, there's no question that if we could turn a state like Germany or Japan into a democracy, we would do it. Seder is paribus, you'll take a democracy over an autocracy every time. But we spent, we spent resources trying to make that happen. Not great resources, and we were willing to live with some real thugs uh, during the Cold War, and we were oftentimes willing to behave in very heavy-handed manners. Uh, a very heavy-handed manner, right? right. Uh, so, uh, so spreading democracy was not a high priority, right? What was of the highest priority was balancing against the Soviet Union. Now, with regard to international institutions, there's no way in a highly interdependent modern world you can get away without having institutions. So we created NATO. NATO was not a liberal institution. NATO was created to fight the Cold War. And in fact, lots of the institutions that we created, including the EU, were largely created for security reasons. This is not to say that they are not also liberal in a certain sense. And in fact, institutions can be both realist and liberal at the time. But the fact is that during the Cold War, virtually everything we did was designed to deal with the Soviet Union. Right. And so, so th those seem like cases where it's hard to tell how much of the strategy is being driven by realism and with, with a patina of liberal hegemony. And one might say, I assume you'll disagree with this, but just uh, for purposes of argument, that a lot of the 9-11, post-9-11 strategies that you talked about, say the response in Afghanistan and the response in Iraq, however misplaced it was, uh, was driven not by a, that the desire for democracy was kind of the, the, the trailing uh, reason, and that really we, we went to Afghanistan because that was the source and the, the location of this massive attack on the homeland, and we thought we had to go in and clean it up. So I'm just wondering if, I mean, how do you know, how can you tell when, a, when, these, when these policies are driven by this liberalism impulse as opposed to some realist uh, impulse? Yeah. And there's often mixed motives, I assume, and, and different people have different motives. Well, let's just talk about Afghanistan, okay, Iraq, yeah. and, and the Bush doctrine more generally. Mm -hmm. There's no question, just to take Iraq, that we went into Iraq in large part because we wanted to deal with the terrorism problem and the proliferation problem. As you remember, the Bush administration thought that Saddam was joined at the hip with terrorists and might give weapons of mass destruction to terrorists. So I agree completely with you when you say that that was the reason we went into Iraq. But we went into Iraq with the thought in mind that we could solve that problem by turning Iraq and its neighbors into liberal democracies. That would create a giant zone of peace in the Middle East. It would take the terrorism problem and uh, the uh, proliferation problem off the table. So it's a liberal solution to some very nasty problems. Right? A good realist like me is mainly concerned about the balance of power. And when you start talking about invading countries like Iraq, right, I say to myself, you're really asking for big trouble. Yeah. This is like going into Vietnam or the Soviets going into Afghanistan. I used to argue during the Cold War, but the Soviets went into Afghanistan in 1979. Virtually everybody in the national security establishment was aghast. They thought this was the end of the world. The Soviets were on the march. I said, this is dead wrong. The Soviets just jumped into a giant briar patch. You actually want to invite the Soviets to invade Afghanistan, just like they should have been very happy about the fact that we went into Vietnam. And as I used to tell the Chinese when I first started going to China in the early 2000s, you should be very thankful that the Americans have invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. And you should tell the Americans that they should stay in Iraq and Afghanistan until they win, because they'll be th forever wrecking their economy and ruining their military at the same time. But how do you, just to go back to the World War II analogy,
So, you know, we were, it wasn't just Germany and Japan. We spent a lot of resources. There were those early covert actions. There was the Marshall Plan, especially in Italy and in Southern Europe, to try to make, keep it, the, this, the communist hands off of it. And we were trying to promote something like a democracy there, I think it's fair to say. Is the difference that the aim there was ultimately to balance against the Soviet Union and that it had this realist justification, even if we we're pursuing these liberal using these liberal tactics, whereas in Iraq it took on a, a life of its own? Would that be the way to think about it or some well, other yeah, way? I think just with, let's go back to World War II yep. uh, and the immediate aftermath. Right. The United States quickly figured out, I'd say by December 1947, that it had to balance right. uh, against uh, the Soviet Union, that the Europeans were in no position yeah. to do it, certainly Germany. Right. So we began to move in in a big way, creating NATO in 1949. And everything we did was designed to deal with that Soviet threat. Now, part of the reason that we created democracies at the time, and the CIA, of course, was heavily involved in this, was because the alternative to democracy was communism. Because, right. as most of you know, uh, in the 1930s and during World War II, uh, it was the left that stood up to fascism. And the left, therefore, had a lot of cachet in places like France and Italy. And we were very fearful that the left would win and that the left, if it won in Italy or won in France, would form an alliance with the Soviet Union. So promoting democracy had a very important strategic rationale. This is not to deny your point that it also fit very neatly with our liberal worldview. But it had a different strategic rationale. That's different strategic rationale. Again, what you want to remember about the Bush Doctrine is that the basic aim of the Bush Doctrine was to create a giant zone of peace by making the Middle East look like a bunch of little Americans. Right. 